Hello, my name is Wendy Wyman and I'm the Director of Programming at Photograph Fisca New York. Founded in 2010 in Stockholm, Photograph Fisca is guided by the principle of inspiring a more conscious world through photography. The museum has built a safe haven of innovation, inclusivity and self-expression by combining art, culturally eclectic event programming and a meeting space for dialogue around issues of importance. Welcome to tonight's conversation, Flipping the Gaze, between artists Pixie Lau and Alexandra Chang. This conversation is the first of three conversations in support of Pixie's exhibition, Your Gaze Belongs to Me, now on in the museum through September 5th, 2021. I'd like to thank Lisa Gold, the Executive Director of the American Arts Alliance, A4, and Priscilla Sun for working with the museum to curate these important discussions. A4 is a Brooklyn-based nonprofit that works to ensure greater representation, equity, and opportunities for Asian American artists and arts organizations. We'll be taking questions from the audience on both Vimeo and Facebook Live, so feel free to leave them in the chat and we will use the last 15 minutes for Q&A. I wanna welcome Lisa and um, thank you again, Lisa, for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy and Jordan and the entire team at Photographiska for partnering with A4 tonight. I, I'm really thrilled um, that Pixie's show is on view now, her first um, museum exhibition, and that we're presenting this conversation during Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Um, I think it's opportunities like this that present the multiplicity and the complexity of the Asian American experience that really help build bridges across communities and dispel popular and often harmful myths and misconceptions. So I really look forward to continuing to explore Pixie's work and all its beauty and humor, and especially learning more tonight from the artist herself and the brilliant Alexandra Chang. So I'm honored to introduce them both now. Uh, Pixie Lau was born and raised in Shanghai, China, and currently resides in Brooklyn, New York. She is a recipient of of a NIFA Fellowship in Photography and FOCO's New Works Fellowship and a Lens Culture Exposure Award. Um, she's participated in artistic residencies at Lightwork, the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, the Center for Photography at Woodstock and the Camera Club of New York. And her photographs have been exhibited internationally at a wide range of venues, including the Rencontre d'Art Photography Festival in France, the Asia Society in Houston, BT Art Salon in Taiwan, He Zhengning Art Museum in China, uh, Format Photography Festival in the United Kingdom, Norderlicht Photo Festival in the Netherlands, among many others. And she holds an MFA in photography from the University of Memphis. Alexandra Cheng is an Associate Professor of Practice with the Art History Program at the Department of Arts, Culture, and Media at Rutgers University, and is affiliated with the Clement A. Price Institute on Ethnicity, Culture, and the Modern Experience. She's the director of the Global Asia Pacific Art Exchange and the Virtual Asian American Art Museum with the APA Institute at New York University. Um, she is the co-founding editor of Asian Diasporic Visual Cultures in the Americas and the co-founder of the College Art Association's Affiliated Society, the Diasporic Asian Art Network. I am so pleased to give you Pixie and Alexandra. Hello. Um, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Wendy. I'm so happy. And thank you everyone who joined tonight. I'm so happy like um, I'm having my very first so museum solo show in the photographics graphics today and no, now. And um, I'm a little nervous. Um, and I'm very happy to have a conversation with Alex tonight. Thank you. So yeah, thank you, Lisa um, and A4 um, for inviting me and Wendy and Photographiska. And I'm so grateful to be able to be in conversation with you, Pixie. Um, and I wonder um, if by starting off, maybe we could ask you to kind of give us a little tour of the exhibition, kind of a background of the exhibition in the space. Yeah, um, this show um, is curated by Holly Russell and um, it's um, the, the first stop is the Photographic in New York. We originally planned to have the show last year, um, but that didn't really happen because of the pandemic and um, now it's finally open in New York and I'm very happy. 
and this is um, so far my biggest show and it has about like 50 pieces of my work in both photo and uh, my other medium work. So it's like um, also the biggest show that I have. And um, I wonder if we might also start off a bit to talk about your methodology and how you came to the works that you do show in this exhibition, right? Um, and it, it's, it, it's very interesting, I think, um, that you came, um, you know, uh, you were in Shanghai and you were in design, but then you had chosen to come to Memphis specifically because your mother had given you a tape of Elvis, right? Yes. I, I don't know if you might mention some of that, but it seemed like the, the, uh, the trail that brought you to where you're at in terms of photography as a, a medium um, also uh, relates to culture, <laughs> pop culture, um, and the film, Antonioni's film, Blow Up as well. So I don't know if you might mention those two um, influences and in why you came to Men Memphis and then also choosing photography. Yeah, um, um, let me just start my slideshow so I can tell a better story. Um, is it this one? Okay, so present. So yeah, like you said, like um, I went to Memphis because of Elvis, and honestly, when I first came to United States to study photography, I have very limited knowledge about. Um, United States. It all come from the music and TV and the film that I watched about the U.S. Um, so I only thought, oh, Elvis lived there. That must be a fun place to go. And I went there. And also a big influence for me is the film called Blow Up. And I was a graphic designer before. And um, I really like graphic design until it becomes my job. And I felt like um, being a graphic designer, I, I didn't have enough freedom to my own creativity. And when I saw this film, I, I just really admire um, what a photographer has control in his own work, that he, he has the final say of how he wants his image to look like. And I was thinking, oh, maybe this is something I want to do as an image maker. And so, Basically, Elvis and the film helped me to decide to come to the United States to <laughs> become a photographer. Um, it's so interesting that you're already thinking about, you know, the control of the viewing and the control of the, the, the frame, right? Yeah, um, because the, I really like um, visual things like image making and my biggest uh, disappointment when I become a, um, a professional graphic designer was my client always asked me to change my design. Like I have, I don't have control over my own work. And the thing about photography, when I watched the film, I was thinking that's the moment that he takes the picture that decides how it's going to look like and nobody can change it after that. And that is something very important to me. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, and I was wondering about uh, Memphis and the series of work that you actually um, did produce there, because um, I know we were talking before and how your work seems very cinematic and the way that you have like a mise en uh, scene, it seems like, and, um, and it's, it's very, uh, very controlled again, as you're saying, but then there's this element of nostalgia and the saturation of color as well. Um, I don't know if you might be able to tell us a little bit maybe about the pieces and the influence in the subject of Memphis? Um, I went to Memphis out of um, coincidence, like I said, because of Elvis and some films, some very um, idealistic thoughts. But when I came to Memphis, I found myself super lucky because that's um, a city was so beautiful. And a lot of places that I went there, it looks so different from where I grew up in Shanghai. And I just feel like it's a naturally um, a film set and people there are very approachable. I just, you know, um, talk to people, say I'm a student, can I take a picture of you? And they're so cool, they just let you take a picture. They don't, 
ask you too many questions. So um, I think a lot of, um, and also Memphis was a lot of um, film with the happened. One of my favorites, the mystery train, um, Jim Jamush. And that just, the film just, when I watched it, I watched it before I came to United States. I didn't know it was Memphis, but when I was Memphis, mm. I just feel like I was like the character in the film. <laughs> like we we're just like, you know, like a foreigner, Asian young people walking along Memphis on the street, you know, seeing like that. So there's a lot of influence for me. Um, and Memphis was kind of like a perfect place to combine my imagination from American films to the reality landscape. Um, I think that kind of um, formed my sense of aesthetics in a way when I'm making images, a kind of very um, film like film set like images. And um, when I was student there, um, I start to make images that look like a film set and went to places that I found very interesting to take photos there. Yeah. It's great to see these. Um, and also in the podcast that you uh, recently were in with Nearest Truth, you mentioned, you talk a little bit about William Eggleston and there's mm -hmm. like, um, you can see some um, interweaving parallels and but it's what's so interesting about your work I think feel as well is um, th there's this almost idea of a, it's almost like a nostalgia for America there, there's almost like this idea of America you know um, and in but there, there's this element of decay as well like that you feel in the images as well so um, I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about that but um, it, it, there's this idea of kind of like a post-war America now you know um i don't know i think that's that's just something about memphis that's just how it looked like it is beautiful because it is kind of decayed um and also um i don't know i i really didn't know united states that well when i first got there but that place the look of the place kind of just um, form the idea of how I want it to be um, in the image as well. Yeah. That's great. Um, so I wonder if you might tell, talk a little bit now about another major shift in which you come to New York, um, mm -hmm. but then also meeting your partner, Mauro, because um, that, you know, really sparks so much, um, such a change in your work and your kind of your outlook, right, which you can see developing already. Um, so really what you're showing here with um, your gaze belongs to me. And I wonder if you might be able to talk a little bit about that moment. Um. I met, met Mauro um, when I was in school in Memphis, in University of Memphis. And um, I actually saw him the first day I went to school. As international students, we have a meeting. And I just saw him and I was even very interested in him because his look, uh, he looks like um, a very uh, skinny, like skinhead boy, like he similar like to, to this. Um, and I didn't know like where he's from or how old he was. I was just thinking, oh, he looks really cool. And he was introducing himself to everybody, say he's a musician. And I say, oh, you know, I like music. I like Elvis, like musicians are cool. So I, I have very good impression on him. And a year later I saw him on campus and I was just, I don't know where I got the courage. I just woke up to him, say, I'm a photographer. Do you want to be my model as an excuse to get to know him? And I start to ask him out to do photo shoots, like photo shoots. So this is one of the photo that I took um, when we just get to know each other. So I would take him to places that I think interesting, ask him to be a model for me in the photos. And then I think very quickly, <laughs> I successfully turned him into a boyfriend. 
and then he he started to become uh, more naturally as my mother when I need to do photo shoots. Um, and this is um, one of the photo that actually helped kind of force me to the direction of making experimental relationship. That was um, about like a year after we started dating. And this photo was, um, because I was so interested in film at the time, I was thinking I should do like a murder film photos. So I asked him to play dead body in my photographs. And I'm very interested in using him as a prop in my images. And when I was showing this photo to my class and people were very concerned and they say, are you, Mm, Pixie, are you treating Moro really bad in your daily life? Like, is he okay with like you asking him to pose like this in the image? And I, before that, I never thought about it because um, in the front, very beginning, he is my model, and he he's actually a very willing model. Like, whenever I ask him to help me with photos, he almost never rejected me. And I thought it's a very natural thing because we are boyfriend, girlfriend. And when people point it out, I start to think maybe there's something different about my boyfriend. Maybe our relationship is a little different. Then I start to think maybe I should change the direction of the camera towards us to take photo of both of us together. And I think that that might be something um, good to explain why um, I can do photos like that because I feel it's very natural for us. And another thing about um, working with Moro is when I saw him in, in the beginning, I didn't know about his background. And then I was very surprised to know that he is actually five years younger than me plus he is um, a Japanese man, which I came from China, and we usually don't have good um, good opinion about each other. So it was a surprise to find a younger Japanese boyfriend. But at the same time, he is the opposite of what I would usually imagine a Japanese man would be, a very arrogant or a very tough he's he's very maybe because he was um younger than me and he was um his personality too he was very um um different type of boyfriend that he he's rely on me a lot and he's very sensitive but at the same time he is very tender and he's willing to help me to help me um fulfill my ideas of what kind of image I want to make. Mm. And that, that's the start how I changed to make um, these relationship images. Thank you for that. That, that. That's really interesting to hear. I mean, looking at that image that you took the pre, um, the image pre the serious experimental relationship uh, and that comment from your class is so interesting because you hear so, I mean, there's so many storylines on television, in film, everywhere about women being the victim of serial killers. I mean, that is just like something that you get hit over the head with in popular culture. And the fact that you turned it and it was the man in the suitcase, like that suddenly people are like questioning it, you know, that's interesting. Um, but then also your idea of like the prop, <laughs> but also, um, that he is your muse, right? So again, you're, you've already started that um, that turning of the relationship even before knowing, right? Um, that mm. um, of his age. So it's interesting, like how everything kind of is like building um, to towards the series. Um, and I also wanted to talk just a little bit about the um, for your eyes only, uh, mm. which I know is like interrelated with it. Um, just looking at that um, a series also reminded me a bit of Maplethorpe, right, um, with his mm. BDSM um, series and um, thinking about alternative relationships, but then these beautiful, like, photographs of forms, right, um, of the body, um, but then also how, you know, um, 
you know, these are very intimate, both this series and the other series. Um, and, you know, usually, like when we're talking about power here, like the Asian woman is seen as, you know, alternately, alternatively submissive or like this dragon lady, but you kind of like reject it all. And you bring this like um, element of intimacy, of, of care in a different way of, you know, this idea of an alternative relationship, something that is, you know, uh, uh, tangible, everyday, real life, but um, but yet something that is, you know, that you've chosen um, that doesn't fit within society's like idea of what you should be, you know, um, within your relationship. I I don't know if you might talk a little bit about that series and uh, experimental relationship in relationship to that. Um. And the for the eyes only, it, it comes out as my um, kind of um, it, it's it's me making up for what I lost in the experimental relationship project. Um, for one thing, is about the composition and color because um, in my relationship project, because I need to show the relationship, usually in the photo, the composition is put back. You see the two people in the photo, they're doing things. So but I want to do something in terms of composition, like really close up. And it's only about forms and colors. Um, and the other thing I want to make it up for the other um, project is because I think when people responding to experimental relationship, there is a, a lot of thought they need to consider before they decide whether they like this project or not, because it, it has to everything to do with how people perceive relationships, um, perceive gender identities. Um, so they need to decide who they are, where they stand on these topics. Then they decide whether they like this project or not. So I want to kind of get away with all of that. So I, I created this project, which is um, related, closely related, um, but it's more vague. It doesn't say who they are, what the relationship is, but you kind of force you to just respond direct to the image. And yeah, I think um, the stereotype you were talking about, like the submissive Asian woman or dragon lady, I mean, they're all stereotypes. And I, I just really wish there were more representation of every kind of women, every kind of Asian, every kind of Asian woman, like everybody. So then there won't be um, a stereotype that will jump out when you think about somebody. Like for me, I had a stereotype of Japanese men because I was brought up in China. Like there is always something like how your brain was trained to think about, like even for the United States in the beginning, when I was thinking about the United States, like my understanding is really limited to the music I listen to, the films I watch, that's all or it's the news I've heard. Um, I just hope there is more representation of all kinds. It's so important, mostly right now. I mean, Lisa was saying in the beginning of this how important it is to be showing your work um, at this moment. And specifically, I know in the US, right, um, during this COVID moment, during um, this time in which there is, again, <laughs> heightened anti-Asian violence, but then also, you know, so really thinking about you know, objectifying folks through stereotypes and um, and how you're able to really um, push against that um, is really important right now. Um, I mean, it, it is always important, but um, especially right now. Um, and I did want to ask you the question about being in the photographs as well, because that takes a lot of courage to do. Um, and, and also really opening up your relationship like this. And so I was wondering, had you had like experience doing that before? Were you in performance? Um, like, uh, and, and it's interesting how you, you do see like these series as rather than documentation as kind of a performative, uh, performative pieces. And, so, and you can see yourself, you know, actually you know, clicking the camera reminds me of Sun Quan Shi and in, in, in how he has, you can see 
um, the clicker and also in his photographs. And we were talking about Cindy Sherman before too as well. Um, I don't know if you might talk a little bit about that process of being in the film, um, being in the, in the photographs. Um, I think, I think it all comes back to like in the beginning, I say I use moral as a prop in the photograph that people might think, oh, that's because you kind of used him like in a negative way. But I also used myself as a prop in the beginning when I was doing photographs. Like um, these two images, for example, are my early self portrait um, before I do the relationship project. And that was just because I am a photog young photographer in some place I really know anybody. So there's only me, like my body that I can use in the image, which to fulfill my image ideas. So I use myself um, in this image as self-portrait. But um, I think there was a very big difference of these self-portraits than my later self-portrait. I feel like in my early self-portraits when you see, like you can hardly tell who the person is. Usually I turn my head away or my face is blurred. And I think it was because at the time I was in this transition moment. Like I just came to this new country and I was learning something new. Um, I really don't know what photographer I wanna be or what type of woman, like just as a young woman, I didn't know who I was or who I want to be. So these images of me, it's kind of mysterious, which I, because I wasn't sure who, who I was. And I think um, in this relationship project, after I start doing it, I start to um, kind of recognize or see the real me and which I didn't even know that existed before. And I start to grow into this woman that I, in my images that I, kind of want myself to be it's like an alter ego for me and I feel like um, I'm more and more confident of um, acting as myself in these images um, yeah that's great and um, I know that um, when we were talking with Holly Russell before, um, the curator of the show, um, she had mentioned like she had see seen your work and curated your work in mm -hmm. different um, exhibitions that were photography based exhibitions, um, really internationally, right? Um, but, you know, she really wanted to be able to in this exhibition really show your expanse of work and your range and that, you know, how everything kind of fit and interrelated with each other, right? Um, mm -hmm. And that makes this show really a special exhibition. Um, and so I was wondering if we could turn a bit <laughs> to some of the sculptural work and the installation work and talk about a little bit about the themes that we have been talking about, but also um, visit some of the pieces in particular, um, because I, I know that we had talked about a bit, um, for example, uh, the temple for her, um, which, which you have in the show. Um, and I don't know if you would mind to, to kind of bring us through that installation um, and uh, how the, the temple for, um, is it Woodson Tian? Is that how you pronounce it? Wu, probably Wu Tian. Woodson Tian. So uh, how she was very inspirational to you, although she's seen as demonized. So like, again, flipping the idea of the demonized woman or the woman with power um, as somebody to actually uh, pay attention to, be revering. And also the breast spray piece, which I saw you scroll through, um, mm -hmm. was really interesting as well. And it'd be great if you might talk a little bit about that, this whole idea of like weaponizing <laughs> the breast mm -hmm. that is seen as, you know, usually something nurturing or, you know, like tender. Um, and, and it's an interesting uh, story as well that you have behind the making of that. Yeah, um, thank you for asking that. And I'm really grateful that Holly and also Photographiska are so open to um, let me show my work outside of photography in this show. And it was my first time that I am able to present my sculpture um, installation and video work together with my photo as a whole piece. And I've been making these for 
quite a while after I graduated from school. And um, so in this exhibition, I designed a, a room um, with all these um, things from different work. And this room was, I imagined to be um, a follower of a evil cult called Evil Women Cult, which I made up, which is the related to the temple where you were talking about. Because um, when I was young, I was actually um, hugely influenced by a Chinese empress um, in Chinese history, and she her name is Wu Zetian, and she was the only female ruler in China through thousands of years, and. I secretly really admired her when I was a young girl, but I just couldn't admit it at the time because I, everybody's saying this woman before saying she is a powerful ruler, they would say she is an evil woman because she kills so many people as any other male ruler would do. But as a woman, you're not supposed to be so ruthless. So she, she is evil. And then because of that, I couldn't admit that I admire her, that I was trying to avoid it, admitting to myself. And after so many years, I started to realize um, the power of a role model to a girl, to a woman was so important and start to think about, I want to create this cult for all these powerful female rulers. And so, I designed this room to be considered like a follower of this cult, then what they will want in this room to um, kind of worship this powerful female. Um, the work you were talking about is the this piece, which is called Breast Spray. And this one is the, this little um, milk bottle um, with the breast. And this one came to me um, through a news from Germany. And in Germany, there was a robbery happened in a deli and the robber was a woman. And the way she robbed the deli was very strange when the cashier was cash opening the cashier machine, she quickly opened her clothes, revealed her breast and squeezed her breast and spilled the milk into the cashier's eyes. And the cashier couldn't see. So she grabbed the money and ran away. And I was so shocked by the news. I think this woman did something marvelous, even though she was committing a crime. She turned um, a woman's breast into a weapon, which, that's not the function that people think that the breast should be. The breast should be a, a feeding, breeding, very tender, represent female beauty, all this you know, nice thing about a breast, but she turned into a weapon. And so that's why I made this, um, this, uh, this, this, uh, this um, sculpture, because I think, um, uh, I made a like a video using the. I'm not sure you can see the video right now. Not right now. Uh, oh, maybe okay. it's the share screen needs to be on to onto that video. Okay. Yeah. Let me just um, change to my video. So I made this um, milk bottle inspired by this woman. And I was using it as a, a just like a watering bottle for the garden. But at the same time, it can be used as a weapon too. Or, but at the same time, it's still Milk. 
So I was really just fascinated by the dual function of a female organ that, that can be at the same time mothering and also dangerous. And I think that's something I, I really like to explore in my work. Okay. Let me just jump back to my slideshow. I also noticed in that installation shot of the, the um, cult temple um, that there was the image of the um, uh, the bag, men as bags. Yeah, this um, men's bags is also another piece that I made that it, I turned a, like a men body suits into a backpack because um, at the time I was invited to a group show in Shanghai, which was happening in the big department store. And the theme of the show was bags. And the artwork is gonna be um, presented right next to those very expensive luxury bags. Mm -hmm. And in China, there's a trend that uh, women like to buy really expensive bags because that shows their wealth. And especially they like to request their husband or boyfriends to buy them bags be uh, to show that they love her. Um, so my idea was to make a, a bag that you can carry every day and show off the man that loves you. Um, and I have a just really short clips um, when I was wearing the bag. This is me wearing my bag running. That's great. Um, yeah, I, I wish that we could only, we could hear the music in that because that was another thing, right? Um, that you're you are a band <laughs> with Morrow too, um, and I, I mean. Just, I, I mean, I love the music that you actually play. Um, and um, there seems to be this kind of um, also a reference to 1960s like sound within that and um, in just in some of your work as well. And I was just wondering about that. Um, but, you know, um, again, I guess thinking about popular culture and nostalgia, um, things that are vintage. Um, but I, I wonder if you might talk a little bit about, you know, being in this band as well. Um, and I guess it's interrelationship with your your work. Yeah, be, being in a band is um, such a different thing for me because um, we have a band and in our band, our roles switched. Like my position in photography um, is his position in a band that he has the total power authority to dictate how our music um, sound like and I can only help him sing or write a little bit lyrics and um, I think the the music that we make together are um, more about like from his point of view and also sometimes about like our common interest but I just think it's a, a really enjoyable thing to be able to collaborate with him in return. And at the same time that I get to know him a lot more um, as a musician. That's really interesting to think about the recipro uh, reciprocity that's um, there within the relationship, right? Because um, there might be an assumption, right? Through the series of works that you do that, you know, he's the prop, he's your muse. At the same time, like you're kind of giving back and forth with both of your uh, practices. 
That's really interesting. And I know you mentioned the possibility of hearing the music at some point within the exhibition. I hope that can happen. But um, just to bring us to the exhibition, because um, the design is really, really um, beautiful and that you collaborated a lot with the designer to like make the vision of these installations happen. Um, I don't know if you might be able to talk about that process a little, but like if people have the chance to come because it is open, the museum's open, like I, I heard seven days a week now, I mean, really to be able to experience the installation of the work as well, like all together. Yeah, I'm really happy with the installation of the show. Um, like uh, my curator, Holly, she like made a selection of work and arrangement of work. And then we collaborated with this um, Swedish graph designer company called Banker Wesso. And they kind of helped me to design um, the exhibition um, kind of inspired by my installation room. So they picked like different colors for um, the rooms and they like, I'm really, honor that they even designed a special font um, for me for the show um, so yeah the, this in, installation of the show is really um, from my point of view is perfect and I, I wish like people can have a chance to visit visit it um, in New York fantastic and so the font was created for you. Like what, what was the for feel the that you were looking for for the, for the font um, and also the look of the show? I mean, it's so um, it's very vibrant, right? Um, yeah, I think they, they really surprised me because in the beginning I was thinking, oh, they, they just kind of select the colors and, you know, and, and they, they just decided to give me this font and like, and, and it really goes well with my, like, um, installation rooms of, of all these like uh, strange objects and the shape kind of and colors kind of combine perfectly um, with that. And the and, wallpapering, I mean, were you part of the process of like thinking okay. about the wallpapering and everything? The wallpaper is actually, I designed it. Ah, so like in sense. the, this installation room, I designed everything, including this, this carpet and wallpaper. And yeah, and then they kind of just designed the colors and the font based on this um, installation. Interesting. Is that referencing kind of like the pool of blood for the temple work that you had done? Yeah, this carpet is actually the pool of blood um, in the temple because I didn't really bring the temple for her as piece into this show but I want to keep it there because that's the concept. So I make the carpet in this uh, pool of blood. And this actually came from, uh, the inspiration came from my idol song, Bjork, because uh, in one of her songs, um, I think it's called Bachelor. And like she sings, I'm just a pool of blood in the shape of a girl. And that's where I come from. Um, I was um, also wondering, um, you know, in terms of um, thinking about, um, I guess, really COVID and um, the pandemic, um, and what as a, you know, as a artist, <laughs> you know, um, what, what have, have you changed perhaps, like, within, what might have changed your practice at all, or um, has it affected you in certain ways? Yeah, I mean, uh, it affected me hugely, I think, uh, as much as everybody else. And um, I think it has good and bad. Um, the bad is I cannot go to locations to do all the photo shoots I wanted to do. Um, the, but the good thing is it kind of helped me to change my lifestyle, change my um, anticipation about how effective I need to be. Like I need to take time for myself to slow down. You know, those are really good things. And I, and I think that kind of um, independent because we're limited into a room that I had just my um, interest in 
space and uh, interiors just increased because I'm just limited to my own apartment. And I guess that's how I decided to like design a room in the show too, as part of like, because I couldn't get out of my own apartment. It's interesting with the room too, because I believe there's like a fireplace, like, oh, it looks like a mantle. I, I wonder yeah. if you might translate the words actually on the mantle for- Oh, the so these, these, these words on the mantle, 九世大族, 天寿如意. So these are the name of the years where, when the, the female emperors, Chinese female emperors, her, when she was ruling, she named her years, like for example, 2000 to 2010, we're gonna call it some name. So these are the years of her ruling years. Um, and um, if you translated it, just like if you, look long enough, you get very satisfied and God willing, you can do whatever you wish. Um, yeah. So. No, that's great. I, I mean, it's, it's great that you're able to, you know, create this temple, this, uh, you know, uh, room for, for this cult <laughs> where you feel free, right? You like, yeah. um, finally, you know, you don't, you can break out of not talking about it. Right. <laughs> but, um, so I, I noticed that we will have some uh, time presently, I believe, for, um, for some questions. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't sure if, uh, Wendy, you wanted to? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you both, that was wonderful. So I do have a few questions. Um, I'm gonna get right to it. First of all, here's a compliment. Tim Soder just wanted to say that uh, the, design, the design of the show is as exciting as the work, great font. So I just um, want to share that. Um, from Andrew Tervoren, has Pixie drawn inspiration from other photographic representations of gender roles relationships in how she approaches her own work? And what came to mind to me, sorry, what came to mind to me just now was John and Yoko's famous photograph by Annie Leibovitz before John's death. Oh my God, yeah, um, I think that image that um, Anne Leibovitz took of John Lennon and uh, uh, Yoko Ono when they're, um, I think, hugging each other and John was completely naked and uh, Yoko Ono was dressed. And I remember that image when I was reading, a, I guess, like an interview about the story of this photograph. And originally, um, Anne Leibovitz was uh, asking both of them to be naked in the photograph, but Yoko Ono declined. She she refused to be naked. She decided she wanted to keep her clothes on. And I was, when I was reading that, that, that just kind of burned into my mind because somehow I really get why she wanted to do that as a woman from a woman point of view, like why she wanted to dress in this photograph. And I think yeah, that, that is a huge influence. That, that particular image is a huge influence in my own work too. Yeah, so great. that's great. a great observation. And then um, from actually our director of exhibitions, Amanda Hajar, Pixie works successfully in so many disciplines, photography, film, graphic design, and music. Does she see these as separate disciplines and practices or do they intersect? Of so, how does music inform, if so, excuse me, how does music inform her photography practice and so on? Mm. Um, I, I work in different medium, but I think for me, they are not very different from each other. It all depends on which medium works better for uh, certain ideas, but for music, I think um, my role of making music uh, was more like a, a contributor, not as like a main creator. Um, but I think for me, the music um, is a time for me to step back to watch the process of um, a music creation and that kind of helped me to think about my own creative process um, too. 
like to watch something um, from a concept concept into the final um, project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know I will add, um, you will uh, be in the museum in August with Pimo, the band. We haven't yeah. set a date yet, but yeah. now that we are mostly post pandemic, I, um, I, could, I can share that now and we're really excited to have you. Um, and I should just note that the um, second conversation of this series uh, on June 24th will also be live in the museum. Um, so we will be with um, Angela Way and Pixie and that conversation will focus uh, really on perception of Asian American women and popular, popular culture. And then the third conversation in August with cultural critic, editor and journalist Deep Tron will also um, be a very focused conversation um, and, um, and have a, a, diff a little bit different uh, slant. So I, um, I, ca I can't thank you both enough, Alexandra, Pixie, Lisa. Um, I think this was like so enlightening um, and I wish we were here together, but um, this was, you know, just wonderful. And um, Alexander, if there's anything you want to say to sort of close the conversation, um, again, thank you. And I'll leave you to, uh, I'll leave you to, 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 to have, have the closing comments. Well, I just um, wanted to thank uh, Pixie for sharing, you know, all this um, background information really and how this exhibition kind of came together in the works too. Um, and I did want to uh, ask you about, because I know we were talking before at the sit-in for Mora, I thought it might be um, a funny thing for the audience to know that sitting next to you behind you, the little, the oh. little, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's our um, Mora set it up as a uh, represent, rep representative of him that he is joining our talk too. Um, yeah. That's great. Um, so thank you so much, Pixie, but I don't know if there's anything that maybe we missed that you wanted to, um, you know, underline. Um, no, not very much, but uh, thank you, Alex. It, it's really great conversation talking with you. And uh, I think we talked about many interesting things um, in, in my work. And uh, yeah, I really hope that one day we can meet in person, <laughs> not from a computer screen anymore. Yeah, no, I really appreciate being a part of this with you. And like, um, I really hope that people will be able to go down um, to see the show. Um, as you've seen, it's just um, really fantastic. So, um, yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you everyone who channeled in tonight and listened to our conversation. And I, I hope you have a glamorous summer um, in New York. And if you can come to my show, it'll be even more awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alex. Thank you.